Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you to Startup Turkey and Startup Adventure for bringing me out here. Uh, let's start off with this. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Now we see who's just checking their email and who's listening. Everybody, I can see everybody in the room. All right, well that's good enough. Everybody sit down. All right, so one of the things that an ecosystem needs is they need everybody that knows something in that ecosystem to teach each other. And one of the beauties of teaching and getting up on a stage or just get, getting into an accelerator and teaching what you do is you have ultimate power over the people in the audience. And you can see I, I made you guys stand up and sit down. So go into your ecosystem that you are in your local ecosystem and teach people. Like you might know marketing, you might know some legal stuff, you might know some business stuff, you might know, you know some design stuff. And that's important because one of the greatest things, and as we go through the slides, you'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about it, but one of the greatest things is when I started teaching about viral user acquisition, I had done it for years, but it wasn't until I started teaching it that I really started to learn it because usually I do this as like a Q&A, hour and a half class. People ask me tons of questions, and when people are firing questions at you, you really start to actually learn something. And so I encourage you to do so. All right, so quickly... And like I said, I usually give this an hour and a half class, so I'll be throwing a lot of information in 20 minutes, but uh, I can you know, talk to you guys outside afterwards as well. So as Mike said, uh, I wanted to be an astronaut growing up. I mean, a lot of five-year-olds want to be an astronaut. I still wanted to be an astronaut when I was 18 years old. And so I went to school for aerospace engineering. Uh, in the course of that, uh, learning about drag coefficients, I got obsessed with Russia as well, because of the space program, you know, US, Russia with the space program. Uh, decided to go to Moscow. Uh, didn't know what I was gonna do there, but I figured I'd just go over and see if I could live. And met a guy who was doing a couple uh, big projects over there. One of them was Mamba, it's a dating, like a white label dating platform. When he decided to leave Mamba and start Badu, then I followed him over to that. And so we built Badu from, while I was there, from zero to 70 million users. Uh, I left Badu in 2010, moved to New York. I wanted to use all those skills that I had learned to really, well, to bring more social good to the world, make the world a better place. Um, I mean, Badu made people happy in, in certain ways, but I wanted to do something a bit more fundamental. Uh, I eventually, I went back over to Moscow and wanted to give back to the ecosystem there. We started building a big tech hub across the street from the Kremlin, uh, which if any of you guys visit Moscow, definitely go check it out. It's DI Telegraph. Uh, it's in the Centralny Telegraph uh, building, uh, right in the middle of town. Uh, yeah, so then I, when I was in New York, and this is, I'm taking too much time on myself here. Uh, when I was in New York, uh, this was during like SOPA, PIPA, these internet censorship laws. Who, who's heard of these laws that were going through the US? Yeah, and I mean every, every country has their own versions of it. And we didn't understand how we could actually affect this. We couldn't go to London, Brussels, DC, uh, you know, Istanbul and, and try to change every single law that came through. And so when I met these guys that started Anchor Free, I finally understood, okay, we could actually distribute something online that could actually redirect the internet, we could make the internet ro more robust, and we could take censorship and give back privacy, take censorship away from the internet. Uh, and that's what we do at Anchor Free. We build, our main product is Hotspot Shield, um, and we build other products that basically give people more security, privacy, and un uncensored internet. All right, enough about that. So I gave this talk a bunch of times, and I dug right into the virality part of it. But what I realized is when I went back to my office, whatever product I was building, uh, the most important thing was not the tips that I'll give you in a second about virality, but how I went about my product process. And so you'll look at these, and I'll, I'll give it to you in a second. You'll look at these and you'll say, okay, well, obviously, that's how you do it. But 95% of you, I guarantee, and I do a lot of mentoring and advising, 95% of you are not building your product this way. And this is the most important thing that you need to do. So when I'm building a product, I think of it in three stages. So there's past stage, current stage, future stage. And so the past stage I think of is whatever's live, what people are using of my product right then. The current stage is what I'm building or my developer is building, and try not to touch that. 
Just let it, let it be built. And then future stage is what I spend a lot of time on these days, uh, is just kind of product strategy. What is the next thing that we're going to build in this product? And so what you need to do is you need to look at the past stage. And a couple, guys, a couple of us have talked about metrics. You need to look at the past stage, what's live, and actually see how users are using that. And it doesn't matter if you have 100 users or if you have 100,000 users. It doesn't matter. You need to start this as soon as possible. So you look at what they're doing and you decide, okay, what do I want to change? So to give you a really easy example, so I have a landing page, I want more people to register when they get to that landing page. Okay, so let's say 10% of the people are registering. Then I'm like, okay, I watch 10% of the people are registering, what's, what's my future stage? What, do, what am I gonna develop next? Okay, I'm gonna make the button bigger. Because if I make the button bigger, okay, more people are gonna press on it, more people are gonna register. Okay, great, I make the button bigger, it's in the current stage, I build it, it goes into the past stage, it's live, and then I see, okay, 10% were clicking on that button before, now are more or less clicking on that button. Is it 12% now? Awesome, I, I made progress. Is it 9%? Okay, maybe I need to roll it back and do something else. And now it sounds like really common sense and really boring, but this is what most people do. Most people, they build something, they, it goes live, and they're like, is it working or not? It's like a binary question, yes or no. Okay, it's not working. Okay, but this new thing, guys, 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 this new thing that we're gonna build is gonna be the thing. This feature, it's gonna blow up, everybody's gonna use it. Okay, let's build that thing. Then you go live with that. But you're never ever watching the real metrics. You're never actually try, trying to tweak you know, a little thing. So the important thing is to go around in this process, past stage, current stage, future stage, and just consistently be trying to tweak, get two more percentage points, get three more percentage points. And that's how you move forward. And it sounds really boring, and I'm, I'm sure you'd rather a slide that says the top three things to do to get you know, 100 million users, but that is what's actually going to bring success. All right, so now into the more kind of virality stuff. So when I think of virality, I think of it as these three main types. So inherent virality, it, basically the de definition is inherent is if a person, your user, will get more value out of your product if they bring other users into your product. It's nothing about, oh, my friend will think this is really cool. It's nothing about the other person. It's about your user thinking he's going to get more value, he or she's going to get more value out of your product if they bring another person into it. So to give you an example, and I'll use Dropbox on two of these examples because they have both methods. So Dropbox, and most people, who knows Dropbox? So most people think of Dropbox in their user acquisition, they think, okay, when I run out of space in my Dropbox, they ask me to invite people, I invite people, I get more space. And that, that is one thing, and we'll get to it in a second. But the biggest thing that gets Dropbox users is that I upload something to it. Let's say I upload a presentation and I want my business partner to see that presentation. So me, the user, I need to get more value out of this product. I don't want to just upload a presentation, I want my business partner to come into the product, see the presentation, that will give me more value. So I send the link to my business partner, he comes into Dropbox, maybe, I mean, this, this day and age I'm sure he knew about it already, but maybe he didn't know about it, and then Dropbox acquires a new user. Same thing if I'm on my parents, you know, I do this all the time, I want my parents to see all the photos of a trip that I just went on, so I'm bringing my parents into Dropbox. And now, now my dad pays for Dropbox, so I acquired them another user that way. So that's inherent. So trade, trade, in, it took me a while to figure this out, and actually once I started giving it as a class, I finally figured this out. Trade is artificial inherent virality. So this is when the user won't actually understand that bringing more people into the product will get them more value, but the product tells them. So again, let's use Dropbox as an example. So Dropbox says, hey, if you invite more people, you're running out of space, if you invite more people, we'll give you free space. And so Dropbox creates this artificial situation where you know you're going to get more value out of the product by bringing someone else into it. And then there's sharing. Sharing is what everybody wants to believe is going to make them go viral. Sharing is, I think this is a really cool product, I think my friend would love it. Uh, there's different variations, different shades of sharing. But it's, it's, I put it down there to signify, so let's break this down. So if, 
If you're doing all three of these for your product, inherent would probably be about 60% of your user acquisition, trade would be about 25% of your user acquisition, and sharing would be you know, 15, 20% of your user acquisition. All right. So let's move on to how I think about, how you should think about how this whole loop, this viral loop goes around. So first you have the user motivation. So that's the reason why they're going to press on the button. So let's say on Dropbox, they want more space. So that's the reason why they're going to press on the button. Then there's the trigger. So the thing that pops up and says, hey, if you invite more people to Dropbox, we'll give you, we'll give you free space. Then there's the action. So the action is I import contacts, and then I invite. That's usually the, the standard action. You want to take as much friction out of that step as possible. And then there, there, there's the reward. So everybody really does. Well, they usually do the first and second one really well. The action step, a lot of times they don't do so well, but the reward step, everybody kind of you know, Fs up. So the reward step, you need to give the reward as quickly as possible, and Dropbox actually doesn't do it that well. You need to give the reward as quickly as possible. So the person took the action that you asked them to take, you need to give that reward, whether it's 10% off or it's more space on Dropbox, you need to give that reward immediately. Because the closer it is, and this is why you know think about like in Pav Pavlov and these kind of psychological terms, the closer you have the reward to the action that the user takes, the closer they're going to associate it. Yeah, mentally you're going you're to remember, oh yeah, I invited those people, I got that free space. But if you press that button and you immediately get free space, in your mind, psychologically, that's going to be a very strong connection. And the reason why I put it in terms of like Pavlov, and because I think of this as very scientific. What you read on a lot of blogs, and actually Kalina put up a good one that you should check out, the Co-Elevate that Brian Balfour, my friend, uh, does. When you read, on, not on his blog, but on most blogs, you read, okay, you create this amazing product and people just magically come to it, and you can't figure out how viral works. Viral just happens. No, viral, there's a science to viral. If you, you need to go through this and you need to get, okay, you need to get 10% more people pressing on the trigger, you need to get, get you know, 15% more people taking the action, you need to get 15% more people clicking on those invites. You just go round and round and you increase, back to the kind of past stage, future stage, you go round and round and you increase each of these steps by 3% each time, you'll finally get to viral. It's scientific, you can get there. All right, this is something about like what product you're building. So the motivation that a user has needs to be a strong one. The stronger it is, the easier it's going to be for you to go viral with your product. And so this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, you know, everybody sees like power, sex, and they're like, yeah, yeah. So power, sex, money, status recognition, health. I mean, this goes down, 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 down to the floor. There's tons of them. This is just a representation that if you're, the example I always like to give is if you're building a product, say, to save people time, and I, I won't ask for a raise of, <laughs> raise of hands on this one. If you're building a product that saves people time, that's pretty far down the core human motivations. Most people don't wake up in the morning and be like, I just desperately need to find something that saves me time. Yeah, you kind of want to save time, but it's not a core human motivation. It's not visceral. So if you're building a product like that, it's going to be a hard uphill battle to get a lot of people to use it, use it daily, hit these triggers, and invite people. It's going to be difficult. So my advice to you, and, and some of you are you know, already pretty far in your product, so you don't need to change it, but my advice to you is if you're going to pick a product, go with something that's hitting a more core human motivation. So top triggers, this is more along the lines of you know, top 10 things that I've done in my career that seem to work. Uh, top triggers, so access to information. People love to learn about themselves. Uh, an easy example of this is like probably everybody in this audience at one point or another has clicked on that, you know, what celebrity do you look like thing on, on Facebook, right? People desperately want to know the celebrity that they look, they look like. It's stupid, but they do, because it's about them. So access to information about yourself is very, a, a great trigger. Connection, access to other users and content. Uh, you'll see this on like, you know, LinkedIn. Okay, you need to pay. I, some of the triggers for invites are the same that can make people pay. So you want to you wanna see who looks at your profile? Okay, pay us. All right, I, I can send the slides to everybody in the audience that pings me on Twitter, so I won't take any more time on this. So a quick one on this. So everybody says email is dead. Email is not dead. I have so many conversations with people, and they say, 
oh, well, people don't click on emails anymore. Not true. They work very well. Uh, definitely, when you think of like how the invite is going to go out, so that's the channel. Email's great, but yeah, look at SMS, look at you know, Facebook. You need to find, again, this goes back to testing and A-B testing and figuring out which works best for you. You need to find what works best for you. All right, popular myths. So I really want to harp on this one. So again, a good product attracts users. No, it doesn't magically attract users. People don't like, you know, hear 100 miles away, oh, you gotta, you gotta see this amazing product that I just saw. No, it's, it doesn't happen like that. You need to have actual scientific, viral, users inviting users built into your product. A good product is definitely important though, because a good product retains users. Users will stay around long enough to tell their friend about it, to actually retain and pay you for your product. So a good product's important, but it's not gonna magically get you users. If you look at all the products out there that have been successful, yeah, now, in hindsight, oh yeah, they look kind of like you know, one of the better products, but having the best technology, having the best product has never in the history of tech, and probably never the history of the world, mean that you become successful. So don't spend all day thinking of some magical good product. Spend all day figuring out how to get your users to use you more, how to get your users to invite other users. So another myth is PR events, uh, getting articles in, say, TechCrunch. Yes, an article in TechCrunch, you definitely go find uh, you know, Mike, you know, Mike Butcher somewhere. An article in TechCrunch will definitely get you 5,000, 10,000 users, but it, that's all it will get you. You need to have actual virality built into your product if you want to get a million users. So you're going to have to grind it out. You're going to have to work on all these things and get that loop working. All right, so final thoughts. And this is more kind of in the vein of doing something fundamental. Uh, I mean, technology has an amazing ability to cheaply, and not, and not with too much effort, actually change the world. And so you can distribute power on the internet really well. You can make people's lives better. And so think about what you're building. Think about how you can actually make the world a better place. Think about how, I mean, the example of like Anchor Free and some other you know, companies like that, it's, it's really the simple solutions that actually change the world and make the world a better place. And I think each of you, especially if you look at your local market, can, can think of great ways to make your city a better place, make your country a better place. Uh, along those lines, I've also learned, and this is kind of off the slide now, you know, we built a, we built a startup in Moscow. We made, it, we made it global. We got, I think Badu now has like 250 million users. We built it out of Moscow. We built it for other markets. Uh, we got big in Italy and Spain first, and we, we, we spread, I mean, Turkey was a huge market for us. I spent a lot of time in Istanbul. I was, uh, my favorite, not my favorite, but one of the best memories of Istanbul was I was sitting with one of the, like, the high up guys in like Turk Telecom, and I had like a 20 minute meeting where I was trying to explain to him the difference between Facebook and Badu. That was, that was a lot of fun. I finally asked him to get on Facebook and within five minutes, you know, meet someone. Uh, he, he still didn't really quite understand it. Um, and so, you don't have to go, I, I happen to be in the valley now, but you don't have to go to the valley. You, you, need, to, you need to work as a community, teach each, other, teach each other different skills, and you can actually build it here. I mean, obviously, you use all the advice from, you know, the angels that have talked to you, the VCs, Raising money is an art form. You definitely need to get good at that. Sometimes you do need to travel to raise some money. But you can build something in a local, in a local economy. I mean, Turkey is an amazing one. Uh, we have a million users online, not registered, but online on our service in Iran every single day. Uh, Pakistan's big for us. We, we have a lot of great markets. And, a, and in a lot of those markets, the local entrepreneurs obviously could know that market better and build something even better than we do. Uh, yeah, so come find me if you have any questions. Uh, hit me up on Twitter if you need the slides. Uh, I would love to learn more about a lot of the local markets. I love this, this conference is awesome because you have, you know, I've met a, a few great people from Iran. I met a few great people from Pakistan already. Uh, so if you're in one of those markets like MENA, any, any place like that, come talk to me. I'd love to learn more about it. 
we, we love like finding local payment methods and different ways to distribute our applications. So definitely come, come find me. All right, thank you.